Hug button. Hi everyone, welcome to the water webinar. Um, today we're lucky to have Luke Miller on presenting, asking growers if their trees are thirsty. Uh, Luke is an orchard systems farm advisor for Butte, Glen, and Tehama counties. Um, thank you so much for being here, Luke. Uh, take it away. All right. Thank you, Alan and Safiq, for the invitation. Um, yes, my name is Luke Milliron, and I'm a farm advisor up uh, north in uh, Butte, Glen, and Tehama counties. Uh, God's country, just beautiful, beautiful part of the Central Valley. And in this role, which I've been in for, for almost five years now, I'm serving all commercial orchard systems, um, doing research primarily on almonds, walnuts, and prunes, as well as uh, olives and pistachios a little bit. So here's a breakdown of the acreage I serve. It's kind of equal parts uh, almond and walnut, and then a much smaller percent is prune, and then only 1% um, bearing acreage is pistachio, but it's definitely, definitely increasing, and a lot of stuff just uh, isn't reported yet. And it's been uh, it's a, lot of, a lot of acreage, um, uh, 255,000, up, up 11,000 since 2018. Um, so I'm, I'm excited that you know, we were just talking about all of the release of positions for, for farm advisors, and then the specialist release will be soon. Um, and we're going get, to get more farm advisors uh, up in this, this region soon to, to help me out. So it's that I'm super, super excited for that. So as a farm advisor, uh, you may know that that farm advisors are are generalists. You know, we have to uh, get called out by growers anytime something's going on. But oftentimes it comes back to water in one way or another. So here we have Phytophthora in the upper left in in Walnut, and then we have a bacterial spot on the upper right in Ammons, which is water splashed. Um, we have in the lower left a flooded walnut orchard when we had that incredibly wet spring of 2017, and we had um, emergency, uh, you know, diversion from from Lake Oroville, and then um, you know the the rivers uh, went over, and there were some orchards that were sitting in water for months, and then. Uh, we have whole rot in, in almonds on the bottom right, and that's a problem that you can get into uh, towards the end of the season if you are running a little too wet or a little too high in nitrogen. So getting called out, and the, the grower says they're calling you for X, um, but it, it often ultimately comes back to um, some water or a cultural management related to water in some ways. So my research program it has five pillars that, that I'm trying to work towards. And the first one is I just don't want, want trees to be maimed or, or killed. And, you know, how can we keep orchards uh, living longer and being more profitable? So looking at new rootstocks, uh, cultural controls, like keeping water off the trunks when you have uh, a sprinkler irrigation. And then the second pillar is evaluating new varieties in almond and walnut and prune, and then promoting disease management of some of our annual diseases is the, is the third. And then whole orchard recycling, really specifically for uh, walnut, has been a big focus of mine. Um, there's been a lot of success in almonds, um, and now I've been doing work in walnuts. So um, that's also something where I'm hope that, hoping there will be a, a water component. Um, Brent Holtz and others have, sh have shown that with whole orchard recycling, you can have greater uh, water use efficiency in your orchard. And then the fifth pillar that we'll really be talking about today is plant-based irrigation management. And the, the main example and the specific example we'll, we'll be focusing on is the pressure chamber. So what is the pressure chamber? Here we are just going to go through the, the soil plant atmosphere continuum that you are all very well familiar with of going from 
uh, more and more negative as, as water travels from the soil to the root um, through the xylem and out through the leaf. And so the pressure chamber is great because it allows us to tap into part of that um, soil plant atmosphere continuum and directly measure what's going on with the tree. And these measurements at midday um, are commonly used uh, for several orchard crops for irrigation management, essentially choosing when to irrigate. You can uh, see the reading on the gauge here in the bottom right. Um, and when that reaches a threshold, uh, you initiate an irrigation. If you check it um, and, and you haven't reached that, that threshold, you can wait and, uh, and actually save on some water. So here's the, the concept in a, in a kind of a bike pump style pressure chamber unit here. Uh, so you have a, a bagged leaf for at least 10 minutes, and then you remove that leaf from the tree, um, and you place it inside the pressure chamber. And then in this case, you get your workout in and you pump up, pump it up. Um, and then when water uh, is visible on this cut surface, um, you take the, the reading. And of course, um, as we showed in that soil plant atmosphere continuum cartoon, uh, trees, of course, uh, and all plants are under uh, a, negative, uh, a negative tension is how we express it. And so what we've done is we've put back positive pressure just in excess of what the negative tension is that the, that the tree was under. And that's when water flows out and you can see it with the magnifying glass. And here is, is what that process looks like. The bagged leaf, placing it in the chamber, and then waiting for, for water to bubble out. Um, growers often balk at, at the expense here. So it's $1,500 for that uh, bike pump style that is, you know, it's with it being such a manual approach, um, it's only good for the lower, the lower tensions. And so it's pretty darn good for walnut um, and maybe the very start of the season in almonds and kind of nothing else. Uh, so really you need to be spending $2,500 um, or more for one of these kind of console units. Um, but what, I, what I'm often telling people is, you know, this is like any piece of equipment. You buy tractors, you buy all sorts of things, and it amortizes over the um, not only however much acreage you have, but uh, these things last a long, long time. I've been using pressure chambers from from farm advisors long retired. So um, it's uh, it's really just the the price of labor at the end of the day. So the simple interpretation again is just to look at the gauge. And, and so we have some uh, ranges that Alan Fulton and Ken Shackle at UC Davis and others developed. So for an example would be 14 to 18 bars uh, in Ammons would be moderate stress. It's something, uh, a moderate stress, a, a regulated deficit irrigation uh, that many growers impose right around the whole split timing about a month before harvest. And that helps control that whole rot disease we showed the photo of, um, and it can make for a more uniform um, and faster harvest. But then you don't want to get more stress than that. Uh, you could be uh, getting, getting into trouble. But the more advanced interpretation is to be looking at a baseline and, and talking about bars below a fully watered baseline. So the reason we need a more advanced interpretation is that on a, a, a tree that has all the water it needs on a super hot, windy day, it is going to just read more negative with the pressure chamber than it would on, on a cool day. And yet that doesn't necessarily mean um, it needs to be irrigated. It doesn't, it, it has all the water it needs. And so that's why um, we've developed these tables for all the different crops by just having really well watered trees. Um, we would say probably excessively watered. This is not how you'd want to actually manage your orchard, but experimentally really well watered trees um, and have them under all sorts of variable weather. And that allows us to build an equation um, and graph this, this simplified uh, chart here. So um, example would be if it's 95% 
uh, or 95 degrees outside and 20% relative humidity, um, and your trees are at 7.7. So this is in, in Walnut. We have 95 degrees and then over to 20, so 5.7. So your trees are, are two waters, or two bars, um, two bars above the, the baseline. So you don't really need to irrigate at all the, um, the fully watered, oh no, it's the other way around. So your trees are 7.7, .7, the fully watered baseline, a fully watered tree is 5.7. So it's, your trees are two bars drier than the fully watered baseline, and it would be a, you know, a pretty good time to, to irrigate. We typically recommend irrigating when trees are two to three bars drier than the fully watered baseline in walnut. So, and then in, it's two to four bars in almonds. And of course, the other best practices um, you know, follow in irrigation management. You don't want any ponding um, that's going to lead to to increased risk of phytophthora. You want to check your distribution uniformity before you start the season. And then what we found, especially in walnut, is that the beginning and the end of the season have really important implications. So um, I should have done it even earlier, but I must declare my bias here that I am not just being an objective researcher and extension agent, but I am just heavily biased in favor of the pressure chamber. And so um, here I am 21 years of age uh, with the pressure chamber. So I've been, been taking pressure chamber readings for as long as I've been uh, allowed to legally drink. So I am a big, big fan. And so this is me as an undergrad studying at Chico State and my, my research uh, as an undergrad there led me to Ken Shackle's doorstep um, at UC Davis and, and led me to do a master's with him during the midst of our previous round of drought in 20, 2014, 2015, uh, where we were asking the question of if instead of uh, pressure bombing a leaf or a, a shoot during the regular growing season, whether we could actually pressure bomb a dormant twig, which, which we showed you could do. And so the question I have, you know, and now as a, as a farm advisor is, you know, we have all this research um, behind the pressure chamber. Do growers actually use it? And so the Ammon Board of California of really all the crops has been the, the most hard driving in terms of um, assessing what their growers practices are and trying to improve their growers practices and, and try to increase the adoption of more and more advanced best practices. And so they call that their improvement continuum. So for plant water status at a, the most basic 1.0 level, you're just looking at the tree um, and, and assessing whether the tree needs water. And then the intermediate level is you have a pressure chamber and you may not use it uh, very often, but, but periodically uh, you would come in and, and, and check what your trees are, are looking like. And then the, more, the most advanced um, is where I'm trying to get growers to, which is using it to initiate regular irrigations. You have that advanced interpretation where you're comparing the readings to the fully watered baseline, and you're using it to start the season to do that, that regulated deficit uh, irrigation around hole split. And the adoption rates that the Ammon board found was that basically everyone looks at the tree. That's unsurprising. Um, and that a little under a third um, are using the pressure chamber and 27% are, are using it at the most advanced level. And yet this is probably wildly an overestimate. Um, and we should be, they should be coming out with, with new data soon. But when the Ammon board went out and asked growers, they did it at small field meetings. And I think the Ammon board field meetings and, and uh, in-person meetings are the same bias that all of our UC grower meetings have in that they attract really the, you're preaching to the choir, you're, you're preaching to the best growers um, oftentimes. And so the adoption rates are kind of absurdly high. And yet um, the, the Ammon board has been able to, to get much, much higher adoption rates. Um, some of the 
larger Ammon uh, processors like Blue Diamond have financially incentivized growers filling out this information on what practices they're doing or not doing. And so uh, a new round of information is coming out soon and the numbers are gonna be coming down considerably, I'm told, um, which is gonna be more representative of the actual industry. So what is my sales pitch to growers? In trying to increase adoption of this, I'm talking about that knowing the water status of the tree has just tremendous implications for how fast your trees are growing, what is your yield, and it has really important tree life and death health consequences. So all of that impacts your bottom line. And I've been told from some of my largest growers that I, they can uh, use the pressure chamber for 10 to $20 per acre uh, cost annually um, versus uh, some of uh, my smallest growers that can't afford to, to pay someone to, to take pressure chamber readings alone, um, or they're small, but not small enough that they would be out there taking their own pressure chamber readings. Um, it's nice that some of the consulting firms that also are doing the consulting on their pest control for the farmer now offer um, you know to hire college students and and have them out there taking pressure chamber readings and so i've been told that costs about forty dollars per acre for that service per year and it has tremendous tremendous implications um, this is some work from bruce lampin uh, extrapolating from some field research he did and after eight years of of growth the trees that were kept at eight bars so much less stress than 16 bars with twice twice the the stress they had reached 80 percent light interception so how much light is hitting the ground at at midday um, when you're looking down an orchard row is only 20 percent so 80 percent of that is shade it means the trees are intercepting light and they're converting that into yield and um, the trees that were uh, at 16 were at 48%. They were under half of the light being intercepted and then 12 was in between. And just on, on four bars of stress after eight years, if you had um, 80 acres, that would be $400,000 in, in lost revenue. So really important implications early on for, for growth and early yield. And then um, in walnuts, especially, it just seems to be a very tricky crop to irrigate, where it's this Goldilocks crop where they've shown that they're really, it's, it's tough or impossible to do um, successful regulated deficit irrigation in walnuts. Um, and yet it's very sensitive to over irrigation. And so Bruce Lampinen and others, uh, had some trees at UC Davis and intentionally overwatered them. And they were able to find all of these symptoms that farm advisors uh, had been reporting seeing um, in the middle of summer all across the Central Valley for years and, and found these only in the overwatered trees. And so there's just uh, more and more um, research from farm advisors and, and extension folks and professors on campus uh, showing just incredible long-term root and tree health impacts um, from over-irrigation in walnut. And of course, we know uh, that, that over-irrigation can also interface with the disease triangle by uh, influencing how much oxygen's in the, in the root zone um, and really uh, getting you into trouble with completing the disease triangle and allowing something like phytophthora uh, to, 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 uh, to take hold. But it's not always disease. Uh, this is the uh, orchard um, following a, a wet spring where these walnut trees, the many trees are, are in decline and yet there's no clear cankers that would be evidence of something like phytophthora and yet the roots look really unhealthy cutting into them. Um, so we just think that this is just simply um, having a saturated, a saturated root zone, especially early in the season. And so this led Ken Shackle, Alan Fulton, uh, Carrie Arnold, and, and others to research this question uh, in walnut. And so they did different treatments, uh, waiting one bar below the fully watered baseline, 
um, or two or three or four. And so, of course, um, you know, this, this initiated that initial irrigation across a long period from, from May all the way into June. Um, and of course, the four bar trees um, are the, the most stressed when they are first, um, first irrigated because they have finally reached their four bars below baseline. And yet, um, when it came to the end of the season, growers had the thinking that we can't run, we got to start early and we got to irrigate, um, you know, hard all the way throughout, else at the end of the season, the trees will look like crap, they'll be water stressed. And what they found was the opposite. The trees, especially in, in say, the, um, the two or three bar treatment, they looked much healthier than the trees that were irrigated when the trees were still basically at the fully watered baseline. And those trees not only looked worse, they were more water stressed. So potentially uh, overwatering and walnut early in the season um, can damage the roots potentially uh, and lead to higher water stress at the end of the year. And after many, many years, um, not only have the, the implications for delaying led to some very minor pros and cons for, for yield and quality, um, it's, it's largely been, been unaffected. And yet, um, compared to, to ET minus rain, the delay trees that are looking great and yielding well um, are basically using half the water of what irrigating purely by ET would say to do. Um, so really important uh, and, and startling findings in walnut from that work. So how have I delivered this sales pitch and how have, have my colleagues, um, Alan Fulton and, and others been delivering this sales pitch and Kurt Pierce on this call? It's often in one-on-one -on -one farm calls and phone calls and texts and that relationship with growers, as well as in, in direct grower contact at meetings and presentations. And then um, even pressure chamber field days is a, is a great way to do that. We also have quarterly Sacramento Valley Ammon, Walnut, and Prune newsletters where we're often advocating pressure chamber use. We have regional websites in the Central Valley Phoebe Gordon and I, of course, have a, a podcast where I'm always plugging the pressure chamber. Uh, we often write trade magazine articles or we're interviewed by, by ag media folks. And then, of course, social media, especially uh, LinkedIn seems to be more and more uh, where I find the most uh, clientele interaction. And then have there really been any sales from, from all this pitching of the pressure chamber? So. Um, again, these, this number is from, from CAST, the California Ammon Sustainability Program, where they go out and do these surveys. And these numbers are wrong. They are just a flat out, highly, highly inflated. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting some more realistic numbers soon. But I think what is interesting here is the difference between the Sacramento Valley versus the state um, at large. And so for using the pressure chamber uh, regularly, the Sacramento Valley was 48% um, had, had a higher adoption by 48%. And then initiating irrigation, 37% uh, higher than the state average for that. And so even though these absolute numbers uh, aren't correct, I think when the new data comes out, it, this trend will hold that the adoption in the Sacramento Valley is much higher uh, than in uh, the central, um, the central San Joaquin or the the northern San Joaquin Valley or the southern San Joaquin Valley, and I think that's because of a couple things. I think it's because of the hard driving um, extension work of folks like Alan Fulton that have been driving this message of pressure chamber usefulness for so many years, but I also think that. The pressure chamber does have more usefulness in the Sacramento Valley because we get more rain. And if you're in a part of the San Joaquin Valley, especially Southern San Joaquin, where you get minimal rainfall, I think something like ET is a lot more useful because you don't have 
the contribution of rainfall really, you know, confusing um, what what the roots potentially have access to in their root zone or even even deeper than what we thought because that work in walnut and part of why um, those trees are successfully using you know what looks like 50 percent of et is that they're potentially using uh water and walnuts down to down to 10 feet in some orchards so um trying to to get that all calculated out in an et which is always going to be a kind of back of the hand you know napkin calculation for someone's orchard is tough to do but is much more straightforward uh if if rainfall is not a significant part of part of the water picture and then i've also had uh just this this winter in some winter meetings uh in-person meetings talking about the pressure chamber uh, in this case to prune growers um, and walnut growers in Red Bluff as well as prune growers in Yuba City so the northern Sacramento Valley versus the southern Sacramento Valley when I asked folks in in the northern Sacramento Valley and Red Bluff if they use the pressure chamber I got over half um, about half or over half of the hands to to go up um, versus it was closer to a third of the hands um, in uh, in in uh, the southern uh, in the the southern Sacramento Valley in in Yuba City and I think a lot of that is the contribution of of Alan Fulton um, and in talking about the pressure chamber to growers and I think that that more and more gains are still possible so uh, one of the big growers in butte county after years and years of exposure i mean he's heard alan's talks he's heard myself talk he's heard others talk about the pressure chamber he gets our newsletters he's very plugged in with with extension he was he was even volunteered to be um, on the committee that that hired me from for my position but um finally uh, in in 2020 he he adopted the pressure chamber across um, his 2000 acres and reported that you know the trees are looking better uh, and that he's saving on electricity and that just intuitively what you know based on irrigating looking at et and um and kind of irrigating based on your gut or when your neighbors are irrigating which is a common way to irrigate unfortunately he said without the chamber he would have you know been over irrigating during those those heat spells and potentially getting the the trees uh, into uh, into into some more stress, and this is just a photo from from last week that Kurt Pierce took. So Kurt Pierce, uh, Franz Niederholzer, and myself uh, did a training for the largest uh, almond grower in the Sacramento Valley, and you know they have twelve thousand acres of almonds, and and only took you know pressure chamber readings about four times last year on some of their acreage uh, but they're looking to dramatically expand that work and so i think that i uh, moving along this continuum of of advanced irrigation management uh is is possible but obviously um you know i'm not going to get them all kurt is not going to be able to convince them all um not everyone is going to adopt the pressure chamber and so what i start with is that um you know ET is, is a gateway drug for irrigation management. So I don't want growers to irrigate when it's just been super hot outside. And so they think the trees, uh, it's probably a good time to start the irrigation season um, or simply irrigating when their neighbors irrigate or simply irrigating for the same duration every single week, all season long, based on when it's the cheapest in terms of the PG&E hours. Um, so there, there are definitely folks who kind of set it and forget it with their irrigation management, but at least looking at ET and adjusting based on um, on the weather is, I think, a, an important first step to take. And then once you once you're doing that kind of work, it's it's easy to uh, to get hooked uh, and get uh, get into the more hardcore drugs of irrigation management like soil moisture. Um, and if you're not going to do uh, the pressure chamber, there is now automated stem water potential readings. Uh, the best correlation has been found uh, in Ken Shackle's work. He's looked at the pressure chamber versus Saturus 
uh, and he's looked at it versus Floripulse and some other technologies. And so far, the best relationship he's found is with Floripulse. And so here we have these sensors attached to, to an Ammon's trunk, and he's found very good agreement. But is it a representative tree? So the first time uh, I was uh, able to use this technology, I didn't think about assigning the tree very carefully. And I assigned it to like the worst tree in the orchard, the tree that is cons consistently the wettest tree. So even though the, the relative readings were still valuable, it was still trending down um, when, when there, an irrigation needed to occur, the absolute uh, value was not very representative of the rest of the block. Um, but you could find a good tree if you have a pressure chamber. You could find a, a representative tree to attach this expensive technology to. And then that that efficacy, that cost efficacy is is also unknown. I think these are about a thousand dollars per station right now. And are you going to use that to irrigate irrigate 40 acres or 80 acres, or, or do you feel like you need more than one sensor because there's so much variability? Um, so unknown cost efficacy, but uh, potentially, potentially comparable to some uh, pressure chamber readings, especially as the cost of labor goes up. Um, and it's not currently available for walnut. Uh, when you injure a walnut tree and you insert uh, anything, a walnut tree will bleed, uh, which leads to pressure readings of uh, zero or positive. So that is not useful. So Ken Shackle uh, is going to is gonna figure that out. Uh, but for now, it's still just the pressure chamber in walnuts. But um, it's really nice. They give you a graph that you can get on your phone or your tablet or your PC. And um, you can also include uh, when you did pressure chamber uh, readings, those are the few stars you see here, and it reports it in bars below baseline, which is which is what we have all of our thresholds based on. So my pitch to growers is to at least get into ET, which is made possible by Kurt Pierce sending out a weekly email where growers can see how well you know what is the ET for their crop that they grow in the area they grow it. They get an email uh, every week with that information during the irrigation season. So that's absolutely key in in getting people uh, to start down this continuum. And then the pressure chamber for starting the season, um, hopefully as a as a weekly trigger. And then if you're going to do any deficit. And then if you're not going to use the pressure chamber, uh, again, you can employ a service to do it. Um, if, if you're just kind of not the right farm size where it makes sense to, for you or someone else uh, to do them, you can have your, your pest control advisor um, do them for you. Uh, you could invest in automated stem water potential, um, but at least use something direct in the field. So even though soil moisture isn't looking at the tree, it's not measuring what we care about most. Uh, soil moisture is still really valuable. It's still a direct measure in the field. And it is also um, you know, telling you things like how deep is your irrigation going based on, on your set length. So it's an important technology uh, that you should have anyway. So. And then some next steps in, um, in where I'm hoping to go is, is, of course, to get the new batch of data from the California AM and sustainability folks um, and, and use that kind of as a baseline for the rest of my career to see if those now more representative, uh, larger sample, um, whether we can bring those adoption rates higher. And then... Um, I'm also doing a, a survey with Kurt Pierce and Clarissa Reyes and Ken Shackle and other folks um, surveying almond and walnut growers about their winter and early season irrigation practices. And then um, hoping to also validate in the field when growers are initiating their, their regular irrigation for, for the year. You know, what is the pressure chamber reading? If they don't have the pressure chamber, what are their trees reading? Are they kind of irrigating based on ET or history or, or some other way, but it just happens to work out and kind of agree with the pressure chamber? Um, or are they potentially uh, irrigating on the early side is something we want to find out. And then we're going to have a pressure chamber training uh, at the Chico State Farm on March 31st. And then um, 
folks like Kurt and myself and the, and the Ammon board um, are willing to even loan uh, those pump up pressure chamber units out to growers. Um, if they say, whoa, that looks like a, a steep investment, I'm not sure whether I wanna do it. Uh, we can say, well, you can give it a shot for a season. I'll work with you. I'll train you up on it. Um, I'll give you the equipment and, and you can see whether it's something worth purchasing. So those are some of, of my ideas of, of how to proceed, but I'm really interested in um, anything that, that this group has um, for ideas for grower adoption, not only for the pressure chamber, but for um, anything that, that you all have been researching and trying to get out to, uh, out to growers. You know, how are you seen as the best way to extend that information or to get adoption? I would be eager, eager to hear. So that is everything from me. It's just tremendous thanks to all of the, the commodities that support my work. Awesome. Thanks, folks. Thanks so much, Luke. Um, yeah, if folks want to um, type in questions or comments into the chat or, um, or, or jump in, um, Maybe, maybe I can kick us off. I have a number of questions, but I also know that I like come from a, a place of ignorance. Um, so um, I guess like, could you elaborate a little more Luke on like what some of the barriers to adoption of the pressure chamber are? Cause it sounds like the technology has been around for a while. Like you've been, you know, trying to extend information about it. Alan Fulton, like, like the information has yeah. been out there and like, is it really, is it prohibitively expensive? Is it really hard to use? Or like, are there other reasons that explain um, why everyone's not using it? I'm convinced. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is a, we don't fully know the, the answer to this question. And uh, my, my colleague, uh, my uh, podcast co-host, Phoebe Gordon, and I like to uh, argue about this, is that, you know, adoption rates are, you know, are really low in, uh, in the central San Joaquin Valley where she is. And she's like, growers just are never going to do this. And, and I'm seeing growers still coming up to me at field meetings or at any meeting saying, Hey, I'm looking to get into the pressure chamber. Um, so there still seems to be um, folks who are who are able to be convinced um, to to get into it, um, at least in in the Sacramento Valley. But I would say that it's it not only is it that initial cost of the unit is often mentioned as a barrier, but it's just. I, I love doing it. I just find it so fascinating to see, to directly measure the tree and have it tell me like whether it is thirsty or not at all thirsty. Cause sometimes it is not at all what you would guess walking out there on a hot dry day. And the tree says, you do not need to irrigate yet. You can wait a few more days. Um, it's really uh, awesome to find out. And yet it is very laborious, very laborious uh, measurement to do, and yet it's a skilled measurement. Um, so uh, it's it's tricky. Both you know you're doing readings at full day in the sun, in the heat, maybe in the spoke in uh, in the summers we've been having, um, and it's tough labor wise uh, because it's tough to assign someone as just a pressure chamber person because it's something that can only be done at midday, about 12 to 4 p.m. So from a, a labor assigning uh, kind of perspective that that's challenging too. So those are some of some of the barriers, um, but it it seems that uh, there's a, a lot more folks um, willing to do it. So. So it'll be interesting to to listen, uh, get these these surveys back, and have more conversations with growers um, about about what the barriers are. Yeah, cool. So you started alluding to this other question I had was was in the absence of the pressure chamber, are are farmers more often overwatering or underwatering or some of both? And um, it sounds like I and, and I was curious if there are studies that looked at um you know the effect of adoption of the pressure chamber on water use and yields like in a sort of yeah uh experimental basis you know like yeah yeah and i don't think that there is much um and and that's why um we have this this survey going out and hoping to do some field validation of seeing when growers um, over, you know, if if growers over irrigate or or if they don't, um, 
I have been surprised. I definitely went into this job just because um, I'm often called out on farm calls where over irrigation seems to be what caused the problem. Um, that I often have the starting hunch that growers over irrigate. And yet when I've actually been able to like validate that in the field by setting up a trial, they they don't over irrigate at all. <laughs> like my my intuition was totally wrong um, in those couple of cases. So I'm uh, I'm really fascinated to get a much larger sample size and and see where there's room for improvement or um you know, if a lot of growers use soil moisture and, and sometimes soil moisture um, is in good agreement with the pressure chamber. So they may not be far off from, from what um, soil moisture would be saying. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, well, since I'm not seeing anything in the chat now, I mean, I have another question. I don't want to hog all of the time, but um, I guess maybe one more for now. I mean, I think it's interesting that you're talking about this technology as being around for it, like it's been around for a while. And so I'm curious, like, like how you would describe sort of like the cutting edge of, of irrigation technology in terms of, you know, how much to irrigate and like how that technology has changed over time. And is it the pressure chamber or is there, is there reason, or there's, is there new stuff that for some reason the pressure chamber still dominates as like the, the cutting edge technology to be using yeah it's that is interesting i think that there's just this explosion of new technologies especially in recent years now with with drones and remote sensing and just i mean when i when i listen in on on water uh pt you know webinars from from our colleagues talking about the latest technology it often just goes right over my head I mean, it's just incredible and unfortunately i think oftentimes it still grow goes way over growers heads too so um, and, you know, an example is I, I talked um, at a at a field meeting in the Southern Sac Valley um, a few months ago, and I spoke about just very basic irrigation management um, best practices. And then Malika Noko talked about um, some drone stuff and more advanced stuff. And she asked growers, show of hands, how many of you have used a drone? And like no one raised their hands. So I think that there's um, a lot of technology out there and in, in, in development, um, but how much adoption of it um, is is unclear. I think that uh, Kurt Pierce and I were just talking about, you know, one of the the best advancements that that we believe in um, in recent years has been just mapping out the the land in advance um, with soil surveys or or even more. Um, uh, fine tune things like various soil mapping, where you can break up the orchard into multiple zones and irrigate by soil type. And um, that can just lead to much, much higher efficiency. Um, because uh, you can, if you have a poor distribution uniformity, or if you, or if you're just you have a real a spot that's going to always be wet and always be dry, um, you know, no amount of technology kind of after the fact with sensing and other things is going to help you. So um, that's another technology I'm really excited about, but it still seems to be be the pressure chamber. And then um, this flora pulse technology is is very, very new. So um, there's, there's no data on grower adoption of that yet. So um, it'll be interesting to see whether, whether folks um, invest uh, in the, in the automated technology. Luke, I'm just curious, how many readings do you have to take in order to get a representative number that you can use for irrigation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the typical way we think of it is like, we don't know how much is variability is out in your orchard when you first start. So we recommend starting with more readings, you know, 10, 12 readings in an orchard, um, and then getting that down to maybe just a couple of represent, you know, trees that are consistently kind of in the middle of the pack. Um, and you could use those as your go-to trees to check for that orchard. And, and that may not seem like doing a, a very thorough scientific um, water, uh, water stress assessment of the orchard. But when we have soil moisture, or we have flora pulse, we have any of these expensive um, sensor technologies, uh, you know, we're often relying on a single spot in the field also. So 
I think uh, it's it's a technology worth doing, even if you're only doing, um, you know, a couple trees per orchard. And and the second part, I think this is something that you mentioned earlier. Do you see, you know, a role of drone in terms of cutting down some of the labor thing that you were discussing? So maybe if you build it, let's say a transfer function between pressure chamber and drone, some indicator or metrics, and that would allow you to cover much larger area in you know really short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah, and that's going to be really interesting to see, and and we should see that some of that early data soon um, is that we have a, a start of irrigation trial in Ammons at the Chico State Farm, and um, Malika Noko is is doing drone flights, um, and then Troy Magny uh, has a, a tower with all sorts of uh, crazy sensor technology. So between all of their sensing. Um, uh, which is also trying to look at, at plant water water status uh, in a more remote way. Um, you know, can can we uh, eventually not need the pressure chamber and and actually have a much more um, whole field look at at water status instead of individual trees manually done? Um, that would that would be great. But that that kind of thing is not currently in growers' hands. Yeah, I'm just curious because I think you know the the lawn just next to our building. We were complaining that there's, you know, the sprinkler basically turns on in the middle of the day. <laughs> and we were complaining and said, oh, because that's when that labor is available, right? Or oh, that's yes. when. You know. So oftentimes, yes. you know, it doesn't matter what technology you got and how much science yeah. you got, they're going to irrigate based on when the, the labor is available and when the electricity is cheap. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's always going to be, you know, that's always going to be a limitation to, uh, uh, to ad adoption of new technologies. And I, I would, my advice to, to folks working on the advanced technologies is always like, if you're going to hand this to growers, it's got to be bulletproof. Um, like you got to be able to run it over with a tractor and it's got to be intuitive and actually help them make, make decisions. Um, Cause a lot of this stuff is just really, it's, it's over my head. So I, I think it's over my growers heads too. Yeah. Anshika, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for your talk. I'm um, a PhD student at UC Merced working with Dr. Shafiq Khan and Dr. Martha Conklin. Um, so basically, I'm trying to model crop growth and water use using a crop-based model, CropSyst. Um, and while doing Amman, we had a few questions. And this may not be what you just talked about, but somehow related. And yeah, I have been listening to your podcast by uh, you and Dr. Phoebe, and it has been helping me a lot. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you for that. Um, so during the harvest seasons, um, there is there a lot of leaf fall due using the mechanical um, uh, machines that you use for harvest? Um, because when I'm doing the modeling of ET, and we were thinking if there is a lot of leaf fall, should we consider that um, as part of modeling or not? So, yeah. yeah, I would say that that depends on the irrigation system. Um, mm -hmm. There are folks with double line drip irrigation and they're able to manage their harvest in a way that, you know, you can't get the nuts wet once you've shaken them. So like they do fancy sweeping patterns and they get the nuts away from the irrigation and yet they're they are, they're enabled in that way to continue to irrigate. And so the trees don't get super stressed and they're, they're, um, you don't have a lot of defoliation. Um, uh, but I know for, uh, for the orchard where I do uh, this start of irrigation study, as well as where we have a, a variety trial of different 30 different almond varieties, is it's solid set irrigation, which is the, the main irrigation in the, the northern Sacramento Valley because of frost. Um, and with that, you don't have the ability to irrigate from the moment you put, you shake the trees and nuts are on the ground to like the seven to 10 days while they dry and you have to pick them up. And so it's, the trees get into just really crazy high levels of stress. Um, and so you have defoliation both from direct water stress as well as from uh, the spider mites that are exacerbated by water stress. So in, um, in some of those orchards where you don't have 
um, drip irrigation, you can get into tremendous stress and some defoliation at harvest. Okay, yeah, thank you. I think um, that was also related because one of the studies showed that the ET after harvest went down and then again it went up. So I'm assuming that before it gets into dormancy, there's again few events of irrigation that happens. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and both from water stress, mites, and I would say uh, ET would maybe even go down because it, harvest is so dusty, and so you you have you the leaves are brown afterwards instead mm -hmm. of green. So, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, just last question. So, how the irrigation is scheduled? Does that also help or you know aid in some way the dormancy period? You know when the dormancy should start for almonds or pistachios? Yeah, I, th I think that that's something we still don't know a lot about is, um, is the end of season irrigation management. Um, and, you know, I think that more and more we're finding with the, the work of Maciej Zvinetsky um, at UC Davis doing the, all the carbohydrate analysis is that we want to keep the leaves on the trees as long as possible, photosynthesizing, storing carbon, um, you know, starting, starting with it is, is high, as many sugars in that tree as we can possibly get before things totally shut down. Um, so, so irrigation and avoiding extreme water stress is certainly part of that, but in terms of fine tuning recommendations, I don't think we, I don't think we really have that yet. Okay. Wendy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Wendy Reff. I'm with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and uh, we definitely have a bias um, towards soil moisture monitoring um, when we're working with growers uh, to do irrigation water management practices. Um, that I was really interested to hear that walnut trees were really sensitive to um, soil moisture. So one of my questions is, um, well, when we're when we're setting up an irrigation water management practice with the grower. Um, we're trying to keep them uh, in between, we're kind of trying to keep them inside of a certain uh, range of soil moisture, right? Like we don't need them to be all the way up towards field capacity, but we don't want them to drop too low, you know, so we kind of set a range of uh, soil moisture that we're looking at and, and we're triangulating that information with ET as well. And, and we could be triangulating with um, with plant moisture status too, but I was wondering um, in your research, looking at walnut and uh, disease, especially, is there is there a soil moisture content that we should basically try to try to avoid? I mean, is that something that we could um, sort of work into our irrigation water management strategy with a grower to try to help them avoid some of those disease issues? Yeah, and I I don't have that number in in cinnabars or 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 something for you. I'm just not as as uh, experienced with soil moisture, and uh, and maybe Kurt can chime in if uh, if he has any idea. But the main thing that I've seen as really problematic in the the interpretation of soil moisture sensors um, with walnut growers, um, especially smaller scale folks. Um, one of my first farm calls when I started was, uh, you know, just kind of folks with walnut trees in their backyard uh, south of Chico. And, you know, they had really nice, fancy soil moisture sensing and he's showing me the iPad and saying, I need, I need to irrigate. Um, look, my, my bottom sensor is getting drier and drier. Um, and so I, I need to bring that one back up and, what we have found with all of this start of irrigation research in walnuts is that the trees, you should let them use that deeper soil moisture um, kind of before initiating irrigation and early in the season and don't try and refill it. Uh, you're really just farming the top, the, really the top foot or two the rest of the season and that's perfectly fine. If you're looking at those bottom sensors three, four feet down, um, especially if you're looking at a four foot or five foot sensor and you're trying to, to bring that line back upwards, um, that means you're probably saturating the top two feet um, to, get, to get that 
that bottom sensor to, to respond. And when you're saturating the top two feet, that's where 80% of the roots are. So that is why in this case, uh, his trees looked really bad, um, was, that, was that he was overwatering to try to, to bring up that bottom sensor. Thanks, that's, that's helpful. Yeah, usually we're looking at those lower sensors um, to get a sense for, um, is there a lot of leaching uh, potential going on? Yeah, but, it is right, definitely yeah, useful for that, the, yeah. Yeah, most of the root action is happening in that top, yeah, two feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, any last minute question? If not, then um, just join me saying thanks to Luke for taking the time and, and talking with us. So what's your clap? Thanks, <laughs> folks. It was right. a pleasure. Thanks for asking me, uh, Ellen and Sophie. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks en so much. Enjoy Luke. your rest of Friday. All righty. You too.